Welcome back on this beautiful Monday morning right here on the Mountain Morning Show. And I am joined by Beth Neumer Levine. She's a communications coach and the author of this new book, Jock Talk, Five Communication Principles for Leaders as Exemplified by Legends of the Sports World. Exciting to have you here, Beth. How are you this morning? Good. Thanks, Excellent. Chelsea. I am thanks so thrilled to me. talk about this very important topic. And I, as I was going through uh, one of the chapters, I thought, man, these, these seem like such obvious things, but we really take it for granted. And so it's so nice to have it compacted in a book like this to help us learn how to be better communicators. So nice to have you here. Thank, Thank you for joining you. us to share some of these tips and tricks. But let's begin first by talking a little bit about your background and when you thought, I need to write a book about this. So I've been doing presentation preparation and coaching and preparing of executives for media interviews and speeches and presentations since the 80s. Wow. So I worked on Wall Street actually and did a ton of high stakes financial presentations, uh, media training and things like that. And over the years I thought to myself, this actually is its own little niche business. And so I started Smart Mouth Communications about 10 years ago. This is the 10th anniversary. And a few years ago, I thought there are certain values that people don't think about and kind of, they, they have them when they're in the audience. They wish a speaker would be talking to them more personally or they wish a speaker would be a little bit more brief. But when they go to make a presentation or approach the podium, they forget all of that. So I like to tell people that you're an audience member more often than you're the speaker. You know what an audience likes mm -hmm. and doesn't like. So use those insights to guide your preparation and your delivery of a speech or a presentation. Talk with me a little bit about how the, the athletic side oh, comes into this. Yeah. I love the examples that you're using. I, the one I read was about tennis. I'm a huge tennis lover, <laughs> so that was fun to read about. Right. So um, my going back to my background for a second, it was mm -hmm. all executives and it was all business people and financial types. Uh, but then when I started Smart Mouth Communications, I had the opportunity to work with uh, certain athletes. Mm -hmm. So I did a, a lot of training for the U.S. ski team and snowboarding. I did some training for the Utah Jazz and worked uh, in groups and one-on-one -on -one with some of these athletes. And you know the common stereotype of an athlete is they're just not that smart. Well, stop the presses. They're super smart. These are people, young, young people, a lot of them are kids or barely young adults, making split-second judgment calls on the field of play all the time. These are highly intelligent people, very coachable, very motivated to you know, protect the brand and build the brand. So when I was um, with the jazz, I think it was, and realized, and this is years ago now, realized that they are playing 82 games in six months mm -hmm. and they have to be available to the media for each one of those games at right. least once. Um, or the athletes are in the beginning and the end or in and the middle. That's more times than even the President of the United States approaches a microphone. You know, that's really an intense schedule of public speaking or presenting yourself or having messages to deliver to an audience. So I had this insight like, wow, athletes are the perfect teachers for executives because once they speak, if it goes bad, it lives forever on the internet. People know about it, it's, it can ruin careers or if they do really well, they help build the franchise, their own uh, franchise, their own reputation, or the teams. So I realized they're really good, um, their stories are great, fun stories, and they make great teachers for executives who have to speak publicly. That's excellent. So. And uh, one of the thoughts that came to mind as you were describing that, uh, what an athlete goes through, I mean, you consider that they're doing a lot of the speaking right after a big game. So even the pressure <laughs> of whether they lost or won right. and being able to be under control right. is incredible. Right. That so sense of self they must have. Exactly. Wow. And the good thing about sports is there's a really only two potential outcomes. There's the win and the loss. Right. Mm -hmm. So when I work with athletes, 
I really try and drive home this idea that you want to think through what kind of a winner you want to be mm -hmm. and what kind of a loser you want to be because those are the only two situations you find yourself in. And so one of the chapters in the book is about graciousness. Mm -hmm. And really, um, the, the athletes we all like the best are the ones who are really gracious when they lose in the, or in the situation of defeat. Mm -hmm. So graciousness is a big one for athletes. And winning too, you know. Right. And let's talk about for a moment, uh, the one I write a little bit about was the egocentric versus audience centric Centric. speaker. And I never really considered this. I, I feel lucky that I grew up really enjoying public speaking and just uh -huh. being in front of You're people. You're one of the rare yeah, people, I'm Chelsea. I'm so weird about that, yeah. but I think it's fun. It's exhilarating to me, but uh -huh. this is one of those things where I was like, oh, have I done that? And it uh -huh. makes me feel I'm like, I need to know more about this. So right. what's this one about and what's the example you so, use? Um, so actually all of my coaching and uh, presentation skills trainings that I do is based on on this very foundational principle of audience centricity. And what it means is that from preparation all the way through to delivery and execution of the presentation or the speech, whatever it is, that the speaker, the presenter, needs to be focused on the audience first and foremost. And so this is kind of the problem that happens in meetings and presentations throughout the business world, mm -hmm. which is somebody's told they have a certain amount of time, they're asked to speak on a certain topic, and they prepare based on that topic, what they know about that topic, all their good knowledge and experience around that topic, and they kind of leave out thinking about the audience. Um, so I take, in the, in the chapter on audience cent centricity, I take readers through the different steps and the different questions you should ask yourself about your audience. What are their specific interests and biases? What's their self-interest? Are they in the room by choice or by obligation? Because that will drive length of time, how much detail you go into. It will drive a lot of your decision making. But that's often what goes wrong in a speech, a meeting, a presentation is that the audience feels very disconnected from the speaker because they realize the speaker is just up there blah, blah, blahing about their topic based on what's interesting to them mm. and ha they haven't considered the audience. The other big audience-centric uh, principle that I talk about in the book is if you bust through your time limit, you, you could have had the most compelling talk in the world and you could be the greatest speaker, but people will be pissed off. <laughs> so time is absolutely of the essence and not going over your time. Wow, so yeah. when you're up there preparing for a speech, how can we stop ourselves from doing these types of things? Because we're aware, like you said, the time problem, and obviously you're like, well, can't you just watch the time? But we're, when we're, like you said, in the, kind of in that mode of, oh, this is such an amazing topic, this is going so well. How do we fix that problem of being an egocentric speaker? So I think uh, preparation is one of the ways. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of people out there who wing it. They say, I'm good, I don't wanna over-prepare. I know my audience, I know my topic, I'll be fine. And when you wing it and you get up there, you start and that's, people lose themselves in their material and often forget about time or forget about the audience. The other thing is to keep an eye on your audience. Mm -hmm. And- um, How so? What do you mean? Well, uh, watch body language, watch facial expressions, watch distractions, whether people are going and doing something else on their little handheld devices or talking to somebody seated next to them. You know, are they with you or are you losing them? Paying attention to what's going on in the audience. I like to encourage somebody doing a presentation to not save Q&A for the end, mm. but to take Q&A in between sections really? so that they have an idea of whether the- I don't think I've ever seen that done, but you say it, that's the better way to do it. It's a good way to- under To kind of break it up. Break it up yeah, and know whether like people that. are hanging in there or not. And, and actually to know whether they 
understand what you're delivering. Wow. So last of all, let's mention some of the other topics that you address. In so the, the other big chapters, so the introduction chapter is a call to action mm -hmm. for companies and organizations to not only have excellence and efficiency and things like that as values for the organization, but to also value communications. It's not as simple as breathing. I think people in um, large companies don't make com good communications a value, uh, they, but they do value excellence, they do value efficiency, and I maintain that communicating is the currency that you use in business. It's how we get things done, it's how we succeed. And so there's, the call to action is start thinking about making it a core value and then it will become a core competency. Uh, but the book also covers the audience centricity chapter, graciousness, transparency, brevity, mm. and preparedness. Those are the five values. And like I mentioned, I read a little bit about the, the Andy Murray uh -huh. story at the beginning. Uh -huh. um, what are some of the other athletes in sports that you Oh, covered? well, the, uh, interestingly, I couldn't avoid it, but LeBron James is in there a couple of times. <laughs> you got him. I <laughs> love LeBron. He has some good examples. Yeah. <laughs> um, sadly, Danica Patrick, the race car driver, mm -hmm. is in there as a, a not-so-shining example. Mm -hmm. uh, the Owner Dan Gilbert, the owner of the Cleveland Cavaliers, is in there as an example. Your eyes make me think this I'm, is a yeah. bad example. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not being so gracious. Okay. Um, I'm trying to think of the other athletes. Oh, uh, I feel like there's another basketball. Well, you just have to find out by reading the book. Yeah, you'll have to find <laughs> out. Uh, yeah, yeah, the athlete stories. I actually had a hard time paring them down I to the ones so that I would use. so many good ones. How there are a lot of good choose? ones. I know. Well, thank you so much for the advice and kind of getting us excited to, to learn these examples from very entertaining people, let's be honest. I yeah. love the combination of teaching something through something that's so fascinating It to should be fun and entertaining. I'm told it's super accessible, user-friendly. Excellent. And entertaining. All right, well let us yeah. know, where can we get this Jock Talk? So, Amazon.com, BarnesandNoble.com, uh, there's a website called 800CEOread.com, but also Dolly's on Main Street oh, and great. any bookstore starting April 7th. Very good. Yeah. Well, Beth, thank you so much Thanks, for being Chelsea. with us here this morning. Appreciate your time and joining us out here on the Mountain Morning Show. Have a great day. Great. Thank Thanks. you for being here with us. We'll be right back after this commercial break, and we do we have much more to share with you, including the Halting Ability Challenge.